We're honored to have uh, Veterans for Peace here today, um, and we have Phoenix Johnson, who uh, is an Air Force veteran. Is, um, Phoenix is from the Tlingit and Haida Nation, uh, matrilineal people indigenous to Alaska, serving the aerospace control and warning systems. Uh, Phoenix uh, participated in air combat missions and support, supported uh, fighter pilot training, live fire weapons testing, and international combat competition. Now interested in civic leadership, Phoenix understands the importance of voices reflecting those impacted and demonstrating partnership in First Nations leadership. Welcome Phoenix Johnson. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you very much. Um, if we could actually all stand for a moment. So I want to take this time um, to properly acknowledge that this is native land, that the land that we're standing on today is home of the Coast Salish people. Um, so in my tribe, um, the Klingit people, we raise our hands in gratitude and say Gunashish for being here um, and being allowed to live here. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, of the Anyak Kusani, the noble people, Klingit and Haida of Southeast Alaska. Our people have traveled down this coastal region since time immemorial, um, where you can find um, where some of our people have been laid to rest over in the Sklalem territory and have had many trade routes. So I appreciate you all for standing up and properly acknowledging um, whose land we're on. Also, my apologies for not being my best. I got in a car accident yesterday. Um, so I have a bit of whiplash and spinal strain and sore, bruised hip. Um, so I'm even more happy that you contributed so many great statistics that I don't have to remember. <laughs> um, and thank you for the introduction. So I am uh, an Air Force veteran, active duty current president of Veterans for Peace, and for that I have to show my gratitude um, for that vote of confidence and the investment in my leadership from Seattle Veterans for Peace. That was a fairly new transition, and uh, our prior president, Dan Gilman, is here, so thank you for being here to support. And uh, for those who aren't familiar, Veterans for Peace uh, are veterans who have had firsthand experience inside what I like to call the belly of the beast, the, the military industrial complex is something that we're very familiar with and we understand from a very intimate experience what the impacts and cost of war are and not just financially but morally and ethically, how people are paying for that with their lives and their bodies and we understand that it's, the one thing that inspires me is that it's not just the recognition of who has paid that cost for us but for the families that we have impacted. One of the most inspiring things that caught my attention that really in, just uh, pushed me to be a part of this particular work and to use this identity as for good is that uh, Agent Orange is something that our, our veterans um, are suffering with. And, um, and it's cutting their lives short on top of so many other health issues. But I hadn't heard anybody else besides our Veterans for Peace veterans bringing attention to the, the children that are being born abroad still being affected by Agent Orange. Uh, you know, we, um, we do a lot of work across so many different planes. I don't know how, how we, uh, they're just so dedicated to be able to use that, that service to go into so many dive into so many different issues that are so important because militarism does intersect with environmental impact, with um, very specifically our urban poverty. What, we're what we'll be talking about today is, um, you know, we talk about all the isms, racism, sexism, um, and, uh, white supremacy. 
the military is is the tip of the spear of white supremacy and and I know that the interest today is to talk about how militarism has impacted urban poverty um, and the economic disadvantage of those those countries abroad that we have violently destabilized but the reality is is that the most occupied country by white supremacy by US military is the country that we live in today from the east coast to the west coast riddled with military bases and I would encourage uh, the audience to look up militarization of Indian country by Winona LaDuke to really ground ourselves in what the impacts of militarism really look like because it started here. So when I started to, to organize my outline of, of what I wanted to talk about today and, and I started writing down all of these points of you know what it, what it looks like to be an immigrant in America, what it's like to follow the American dream, what it's like to live as a person who, was, who their ancestors were forced to live here. And what it means to be of the even, you know, white economically disadvantaged population living in poverty. And, you know, I kept coming back to the point that all of these articles, all of these studies and statistics that I've read have talked about the U.S. as the default is, is white. And, and that really threw me off of creating this outline. So I, I started at the root. What does it look like to be an economically disadvantaged, somebody living in poverty who is born of the soil of North America? And for an indigenous woman, we make 57 cents on the dollar. And the, what I realized through my own personal experience is that the more formalized education, we can argue that formalized education is colonial um, indoctrination, which is, is true, is that I, I myself had more and more struggle um, obtaining safe, stable, um, compensated work. And, and it wasn't in my head because one of the studies that I had read was that indigenous women, the more formalized education they achieve, they actually go down to 55 cents on the dollar. That a woman with a master's degree, a First Nations woman who has survived genocide and even, you know, off the backs of her ancestors holding her up who has achieved a master's degree is commonly found to make the equivalent of a white male with an associate's. So when we look at the destabilization and urban poverty and the relationship with militarism is that you look at the complete exploitation, reaping and raping of North America, the Black Hills, there's gold, there's lumber, and now there's tourism, now there's um, you know, materialism, and that Turtle Island, as we call it, as our Unchimachamaca is, is that she's given so much to turn for, for profit. And none of this is going back to First Nations. And so we've given up our home, we've given up our land, we've given up our well-being. And millions of us have died for these resources to be exploited. We have oil um, that is now an interest across the entire globe that we've used as an excuse to invade the Middle East for. And we have completely decimated other economies to so I think about the potential that we could have had as First Nations, the economies that we had that were thriving, that were harmonious, what would that look like in 2019? What would those economies look like in other places that we have meddled with, that we, the US military, has meddled with? And we commonly, you know, as Trump affectionately referred to these other places as the whole countries, they don't necessarily have a chance when they're getting punched in the face repeatedly, um, when they're, they're dying at the hands of the US and the American dream, and I'd argue that the American dream is genocide. So we have what happened here, and we have the military occupying some 170, 180 different countries. Okinawa, Hawaii, one of the most militarized um, places abroad, 
And then we have, and we have Mexico, right? So we have this, all these destabilization everywhere, and then we have this influx of people seeking asylum, of wanting to find stability, who are hearing this message being broadcasted across the world of the American dream, where you can come and get whatever you want, what you need, you can be whoever you want. But when you get here, that's not the case. Is that our working environments are not conducive for people of color, for not for women, that the legal hoops and all the stats that I was gonna share today, <laughs> uh, it's not conducive to the survival of anybody. Just psychologically, socially, living in America as a non-white person and as a non-male person is traumatic. And the cycle continues. And white supremacy continues. And the agenda of what has now become the modern day manifest destiny continues. And we are targeting our economically disadvantaged urban populations. And what we like to refer to as, our, as the poverty draft is we find those people affected by who just struggle, right? Struggle to go through school, who are not supported in school, right? We, we can look at the educational statistics of, of young children of color who are being left behind. And the stigma and statistics that are being assigned. My child is indigenous and black, and they almost convinced me that my own child was deficient, that they kept filtering her down into lower reading classes, telling me that she was barely getting by. And you know, I even went as far as testing her for a disability. And, and this is what America does to children. So then, if you don't have someone advocating for you because you're so busy surviving, and you're going into a workforce that doesn't recognize you or your skill or your worth, and it's normalized violence, or you can't even make it to your adulthood, and now we have the military come in with, now there are Xboxes, there are water bottles and stickers, there are jumpy houses, and they're coming into your children's schools. And I was a part of that, that normalization, that recruitment, that sensationalism. I went into elementary schools in my uniform and I read books to children and talked about how great the military was. And one day they could achieve what is you know, the highest level of American accomplishment is to serve your country. And so you have these folks coming in with all of these really exciting, you know, perks, right? We have uh, enlistment bonuses, and we have people who are just desperate to belong, desperate for stability, desperate because they've never been afforded the opportunity to see how fantastic and amazing and accomplished and how much potential they really have. And we prey on them. So we have the poverty draft, and that's how that happens. The cycle continues, and there's stories that stood out to me from um, you know, a, a veteran that I was close to some years ago, and he had said, as a Lakota man, I was in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we were out on patrol, kicking down doors, as we call it. And I kicked down a door, and I looked in, and I saw a family huddling together, and they looked just like me. And that was his moment of recognizing how he had come full circle and that now he was a part of destabilizing other countries, of breaking up families. So if you were to ask me if the military had um, a firsthand relationship with urban poverty, yeah, absolutely. That it has created America, that it has created this economy that pushes people down and that it is going into other countries and it's disrupting their potential of where they could be. And um, I know that our next speaker will be talking a little bit about, um, if I have my understanding correctly anyways, I'm sorry if I'm misspeaking, but the border. And so if we look at Mexico as being colonized, and we look at the, the economy that was formed out of exploiting um, you know, the indigenous people there that are just relatives of ours, um, based off of gold and silver, and it has those echoes go for hundreds of years. So we're all in this together. We are. And I had the gift of hosting, helping to host, 
three indigenous speakers from Okinawa, Hawaii, and Guam, and it was held at El Centro de la Raza, so we could connect so many communities together, and we could really talk about how we are in this together, how we are all really connected, and how every day, and our, our allies, our white allies and our advocates can step up, and we can have these conversations about what it looks like to demilitarize our way of thinking, how to decolonize our way of thinking, and how to take that into our work whether that be our activism or what we do on the job, through our employment and with our children. And I would encourage everybody today to really look at how you have been indoctrinated into these ways of thinking and what you can do to slowly unravel some of this so we can come up with a new way to live more harmoniously together, a more just way, where there is real equity, where there's real reconciliation and where we can get to reparations. This is a, a beautiful event. Uh, I um, am certain that when US Army recruiters show up at your students' high school, they don't advertise a poverty draft. <laughs> and, and I'm equally certain that at the US border, they don't refer to uh, what they're doing as kidnapping and caging children. But that's, in fact, what they're doing. So um, with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Sinia Melodrano. Uh, he's a staff attorney with the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project. I know I slaughtered the name, and I apologize in advance. Uh, she works with the Family Services Union for providing direct uh, representation to individuals applying for family-based visa petitions and removal proceedings before the before joining the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project, she was a staff attorney with the Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project in Florence, Arizona, where she provided pro se assistance and direct representation to adults in detention facing removal. Yesenia attended Seattle University for both her undergraduate and law degree. Welcome, Yesenia. Thank you for inviting NERP here to speak and share about our work. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Yesenia Medrano, and I'm a staff attorney at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. We also call it NERP for short. Um, and um, NERP is a legal services organization here in Washington State. Um, we have been uh, working to defend immigrant rights since 1984. Um, and we're now the largest organization in the country um, providing direct legal representation to immigrants here in the, in the United States. Um, we um, are a staff of over 100 full-time staff, um, and I'm just sharing a little bit of information for those who aren't familiar with NERP. Um, we have four offices throughout the state of Washington. So um, our biggest office is here in Seattle, which is the office that I work out of. And then we also have an office in Tacoma, um, which is able to work directly with the detained population. Um, for those of you who know and, and don't know, um, there we have a, a private immigration detention center right here in Washington, the Northwest, Immigrant, um, Northwest Detention Center, um, which is run by the GEO Group. And um, our uh, office in Tacoma is able to work directly with those individuals and a lot of times continue working with them after they're released. We also have offices in Granger, which is um, kind of southeast Washington, and one in Wenatchee, which serves the eastern Washington population. Um, and along with uh, direct client services, we also um, engage in kind of broader nationwide um, direct um, impact litigation. Um, so we have a number of lawsuits. Um, and, and have been able to bring a number of actions in, in collaboration with other national organizations and allies to challenge, um, especially the most recent presidential administration's policies um, against our immigrant communities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, recent policies have affected um, immigrant communities in terms of family separation and also um, further increased militarization at the border. Um, so I work in the Family Services Unit, and um, what that means is I focus on uh, assisting individuals who um, a lot of times are here in the United States and petitioning for 
family members who sometimes are outside of the United States um, in helping them come to the United States. Um, so family, family, the family visa uh, process is the most common form of immigration um, and when people refer to legal immigration, um, I think a lot of times they're thinking of the family visa process. And um, as we all know, the wait times for legal immigration are um, pretty outrageous, um, especially uh, it, it all depends on um, what relationship you have to the family member outside of the United States and what, what the petitioner or the person here in the United States, what their legal status is. So only lawful permanent residents and U.S. citizens can petition for family members. Um, and they can only petition for certain family members. So um, like parents, um, brothers and sisters, and um, um, children. Um, so uh, one of the ways that um, the presidential administration's policies have affected families and increased family separation is through the travel ban. Um, so we saw that our U.S. Supreme Court um, upheld this travel ban um, back in June of 2018. And the travel ban affects or limits immigration um, from six countries. Um, the six countries are Iran, Libya, North Korea, Syria, Venezuela, Yemen, and Somalia. Um, and one of the ways that we have seen this policy affect our clients, um, I'll just give you a, an example. Um, is, uh, well first I'll, I'll give you a little uh, kind of like a background of how the family visa petition process works. So um, first the family member here in the United States needs to petition their family member outside of the United States and they do that with an I-130. Um, and so again, depending on who that family member is can, depend, can determine how long it takes for that visa to be approved. And then after, the second step is a con the consular processing. So the family member who's outside of the United States will attend a consular interview in their home country, and the consular officer will determine whether or not that individual will receive a visa and be allowed to enter the United States. So the way that the travel ban affects this is um, after the petition is filed and approved, the individual goes to their consular interview, and now if somebody is, um, the applicant is applying from one of those six countries, a lot of times, um, well, most of the time, because of the travel ban, that individual will be refused, their visa will be refused. Um, and there is an exception, uh, there is a waiver, um, and so when the visa is refused, they can be placed in administrative processing where they have to wait several months, maybe years, um, until the visa is, um, until the waiver is granted. And there's no, there's no um, real criteria for how um, it's determined whether or not somebody is granted a waiver. So in one of our cases um, that we, we've been working on since 2014, um, we had a father uh, who's a U.S. citizen and he petitioned for two of his children um, who are Somali citizens but born and raised in Kenya. And um, at the time that he petitioned for his children in 2014, the children were eight and nine years old. The petition, it took four years for the petition to be approved. Then they were scheduled for their consular interviews in September, so after the travel ban um, went into effect. Um, at their interviews, both now um, 13 and 14 year old were refused. Um, we um, reached out to the consulate and you know, sent additional supporting documents trying to request that the waiver be granted. Um, fortunately for the younger um, son, the waiver was granted and he's now been reunited with his father. Um, but we continue and we're hopeful that the other son um, will be granted a waiver as well. Um, Another um, policy that we saw over the summer was uh, the zero tolerance policy. And um, this policy just served to further criminalize uh, individuals who are entering um, without inspection and particularly focused on families. 
um, separating or punishing parents who were coming with their children. Um, so just to be clear, the U.S. has always um, criminalized uh, individuals who are entering without inspection. And we, when we say entering without inspection, we mean somebody who's entering outside of a port of entry. Um, so ports of entry are along the border, um, and not just the southern border. There's, um, this is, we're talking about all the way around the United States and in airports. Um, so maybe somebody who crossed through the desert. Um, crossing through the desert, entering without inspection is a misdemeanor, and re-entering without inspection is a felony. So since 2005, um, the government has been criminally prosecuting individuals who enter in this manner. Um, and then the individual will have to serve a sentence in a federal prison, and then they'll probably be deported, or they may end up in immigration detention. So the zero tolerance policy um, served to increase the number of people who um, were being criminalized for entering without inspection, and then again target, targeted um, parents who are entering with children. Um, and as we know, um, approximately 3,000 children were separated from their parents during this time. Um, we also know that about 200 um, people, not only parents, 200 adults were, separate, were um, brought to Washington and detained in the Federal Detention Center in SeaTac, um, 50 of whom were parents um, who probably had no idea where their kids were. Many of them did not. Um, Fortunately, when we heard about this, um, because detaining individuals at the Federal Detention Center was a new thing, um, we had not seen this in the past. Um, NERP, with the help of um, several volunteers, were able to represent all of the parents and um, many of the other 150 individuals who were detained at the Federal Detention Center. And then in July, a uh, federal court ordered the reunification of the parents and children um, and just overnight, anyone who, uh, the parents who were still detained were transferred to Harlingen, Texas um, for reunification and then released. So we know um, with kind of the news around the caravan and everything happening on the southern border, family separation continues. Um, and NERP is actively trying to fight back against that. Um, we also know that the government has... Um, the current administration has shifted to further limiting um, the ability for people to um, try and apply for asylum by, by limiting who can apply for asylum, and then by forcing people who are applying at the ports of entry, illegally immigrating, um, by forcing them to stay in Mexico. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we've been doing on kind of like a broader scale. Um, so we hear a lot about um, Border Patrol presence along the southern border. Um, but as I mentioned, um, Border Patrol is all around the United States. In fact, there's a 100-mile uh, border zone that is around the perimeter of the United States. And within those 100 miles, um, Border Patrol has um, basically increased power or authority to um, conduct Border Patrol stops and checks, um, and our rights are limited within those zones, even as citizens. Um, so here in Washington State, uh, Spokane actually has a Border Patrol headquarters, and um, we have been seeing increased presence of Border Patrol in um, Spokane, particularly at the Greyhound bus stop. Um, where Border Patrol actively gets on buses and asks people about their immigration status. And that's happening in Spokane. Um, so with allies in the community, we're continuing to monitor that, monitor that and helping individuals there um, file administrative complaints. Um, we just recently settled a lawsuit in Yakima County um, where Yakima was um, holding individuals in county jail um, for ICE to come and pick up and then um, move to detention. And um, they've agreed not to hold anyone uh, unless there's a federal judicial warrant now. Um, we're also awaiting a decision um, in a suit against the Tequila Police Department 
where Tukwila police recently decided to enforce um, immigration um, on their own and uh, handed someone over to ICE after an arrest. Um, so these are just um, a few of the updates from some of the, the broader um, advocacy that we're engaging in, and um, we really appreciate um, y'all inviting us here to share our work and um, continued support for our organization. Thank you. Um, if I was a parent who had been deported and my children were separated from me, um, now I'm back in Guatemala, how do I find my children? Um, that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, I think it depends. Um, so if the, if the children also immigrate um, with parents, um, a lot of times uh, if, if they're separated, the children are placed in ORR custody, um, Office of Refugee Resettlement um, custody, and so um, there's ways to try and contact them and um, hopefully have the kids reunited with parents. Um, but then there's also the situation of children who um, were born here um, and are UN United States citizens and their parents um, are from another country and they also get separated. Um, and so, um, I mean, a lot of what we're telling families is to have, um, try and have a safety plan um, where you have kind of like all of the children's um, passports in order and um, also have somebody that you trust that knows, that can um, have uh, power of attorney to sign for your children um, if anything happens. And um, hopefully um, either the children can be reunited with the parent in the home country or um, if the parent and the children want the children to stay here, they can stay here with, with another person that they trust. My question's for Phoenix. Um, so our president recently made this comment about um, he has the guns, the military, the police. It was, they weren't sure if it was some flippant statement, but I was curious, what do you feel if he were to lose the election but he wouldn't leave and he called upon his base, the military and the police to support him? Do you think there'd be support from the military? That is a very interesting, complicated question. We would probably find ourselves in a very big mess. Uh, you know, my mind jumps to how, how that would work out legally, right? But if I were to speak on the members in the military and how they would feel about that is, uh, you know, I can, I can speak on my personal experience of what it's like to to you know, be in that environment and the, the propaganda that we're exposed to, right? The ideas um, that are fed to us, uh, and they're very efficient at it. And I know that they are consulting, the, the they are consulting um, with so many different forms that would align with the psychological warfare and, and brainwashing. And I know that sounds a little bit conspiracy theorist, um, but they've really perfected you know, their process. And, and I do remember a moment where um, I was in boot camp and there was no sitting down, there was no resting, there was no sleeping, there was nothing besides uh, screaming and cleaning and push-ups. <laughs> and um, and I, I don't identify as, as a Catholic or Christian, but, you know, that is the nation's religion on paper, and we do have our chaplains and our, our churches, and that was the one place I could go to sit down. And I didn't for a while, but other folks were saying, come on, come with me. And I sat in the pew, and what I saw in front of me was a large projector, projector screen with very patriotic music playing, and it was murder in the video. It was bombing, it was missiles, it was um, direct live fire, and it was a part of my indoctrination. And so if you were not outright basically racist against our enemy, then you were chastised for it. You were, you were othered because of it. And I think that puts us in a place where, 
you know, our commander in chief, there is no question about the orders that you follow when you're in the military. That is the ultimate authority. And you say, yes, sir. Um, and so I think with that particular combination, that there are a lot of people that will be very loyal um, and that there are a lot of articles that, you know, I've read and, and a lot of things that I've witnessed um, and my comment about saying that the military is the tip of the spear for white supremacy is it's very true because that is a, a militarism and Americanism, that sensationalism is, is built into our culture to make this a situation where this mentality thrives. And um, so not only are they indoctrinated, but people seek these kinds of places to play out their ideas um, of supremacy. Hi, my name is Glenn. Um, this is for the lawyer, immigration lawyer, right? Um, I'd like to know if there's a difference between a resident, a, a citizen, and a dreamer. Are there legal differences between these um, three different ways of being here in America? And if even with or without criminal backgrounds, are any of these three at risk of being deported? You got the question? Yes. Does it make any sense? <laughs> Thank okay. You. All right. Thanks. Yes, um, there are differences. Um, so, um, and I think when you say dreamer, we're talking about individuals with, with DACA status, um, although the um, dreamers are different than uh, individuals with DACA status. Um, so DACA isn't, um, it's, it's very temporary. Um, it isn't actually um, considered like legal status. Um, it's, uh, I mean, a, it's a form of protection, but um, you can't leave the United States um, unless you have a, advanced parole, which is like a special permission, and that's very difficult to receive. And if you do leave the United States, even with advanced parole, there's no guarantee that you'll be allowed back in. Um, any sort of arrest can um, basically revoke your DACA status. Um, if you have any encounter with Border Patrol, um, that could also revoke your DACA status, um, and then you would be undocumented and uh, likely placed in proceedings. Um, and uh, this is a really good question because I think a lot of people believe that lawful permanent residents um, essentially are, have the same rights as United States citizens, but they don't. Um, lawful permanent residents, um, they can't vote, um, if they commit certain crimes or are arrested for certain crimes, they can be placed in proceedings and can be deported. Um, if a lawful permanent resident is outside of the United States for six months or more, they can be seen as um, abandoning their residence and the government can initiate uh, like revocation of their lawful permanent resident status. Um, so they can travel outside of the United States, um, but their, their rights are also um, pretty limited. Um, and then as a citizen, we have um, the rights that, that we're guaranteed, but um, not always protected. Um, so, I mean, I think another thing that um, has been talked about a lot is um, like DACA status, and um, because it's very temporary, um, it's set to expire in, um, I believe, 2021, 2020. Um, and people are still able to renew that status, but if you are eligible for DACA and you didn't initially apply for it, you can no longer apply for it. So even, even though you might be eligible, if, if that person missed their opportunity to apply for it, unfortunately they can't receive it now. Um, and it's, it's set to expire after a certain amount of time. So um, it's a very, very limited um, kind of protection. Thank if you we, both so much. It, oh. Could we pause real quick? Because there's something really relevant that I wanted to mention from the last question. Um, is uh, I want to make sure there's a delineation around um, personal thought and then what, what could actually happen because I don't want to fear monger at all. But I also want to mention um, that the importance of having conversations with family members and loved ones and friends in active duty is because there is, uh, you can apply for conscientious objector status. Um, I do have 
you know, veterans and, and my other veteran organization that are uh, actually not veterans but active duty members going through that process. And there's about 200 per year that do apply successfully and leave the military because um, they're saying that they don't agree with, with what it is to serve in the military. Um, so I just want to make sure I mention that. Thank you for your patience. Oh, yeah. No, th thank you. Um, so uh, I don't know that this is quite a clear question, but I'm curious about the role of the U.S. military in tr uh, how our um, kind of homegrown militias develop and um, the kind of ideology of, of the, the militias, especially those at our southern border. Um, and how uh, how military culture has uh, seen given rise to to those um, to those groups. That's a really great topic to bring up. So what I'm hearing is uh, kind of asking about that relationship, or is there a relationship, or maybe how that influences. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, coincidentally, I was just reading about that this morning and yesterday. We had the No War on Venezuela action. Um, and uh, to make it clear, our standpoint is that the people have a right to self-determination, um, that white supremacy has no, no place in any, any other country. If we could just contain that here, that'd be great. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, at the exact same time, there was a, a, a group of men, um, uh, referred to as men's rights activists. Uh, and so a lot of articles that I was researching to help share information about what these um, typically who is involved in this type of, of group or, or even formal organization is those who are very aligned with alt-right theory and then folks who are also um, enlisting themselves into their self-formed militias and um, commonly have a lot of problematic ideas um, as far as uh, very, being very anti-feminist, um, a lot of, uh, you know, very white supremacist thinking oftentimes and... Um, so I was able to dive in a little bit about the militias because uh, that a lot of these forums that I was reading is actually there were men commenting, um, saying, well, in, in our militia, or don't worry, we've armed ourselves. And so um, I think that there is a direct relationship between militarism and militia that sometimes uh, these, these uh, oftentimes, in my, in my perspective, no formal data here, but... Um, I don't see a lot of the folks in these militias being prior military, but I do think there's a lot of people that are like the folks that have said, well, I almost went into the military or I had, you know, I hurt my ankle, so I had to get out. <laughs> um, so a lot of it is that sensationalism that of just uh, really putting white supremacy and militarism on a pedestal and wanting to recreate that kind of identity and taking um, the right to bear arms and et cetera to a, a very lengthy degree. Um, and so oftentimes you'll see, you know, they do like to wear, you know, military surplus stuff that they've gotten. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely a relationship there in my mind. So this is for Phoenix. Um, my name is Ronell. I performed with the Mahogany Project. Shout out to Mahogany Project. Um, I live in Bremerton. I come from a very military family, uh, family friends who served. My father is a veteran who currently works for the government. My brother is in the Army right now. So my question for you, Phoenix, was when you started becoming aware of these issues regarding military indoctrination, um, indoctrination, what was that transition, uh, transition like, you know, calling that out in those spaces and also, you know, being mindful of what other active duty and veterans were thinking at the time? Because I could imagine bringing awareness to these issues would probably not be just what certain um, military personnel would want to hear. I definitely can appreciate that question and what it's like to live in a military family. Background on me is I, I do come from a military family. And uh, so that journey from being, that being a part of our identity and then moving, and now I'm like 
the president of Veterans for Peace, how the heck did that happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> like talking to active duty members saying, this is what, these are the forms you need. I'll hook you up with this hotline of people that are just like you. And um, it was a multi-part question, so I'm trying to figure out how to form it. Um, could you maybe give me a couple points of, yeah. of that question one more time? So, I mean, for so instance, what was that like? Just like if you were, you've, when you began involvement in Veterans for Peace, um, mm -hmm. and maybe when you started talking to other veterans, like about some of the issues you brought up, like how was that reception? Or, you know, were you, did you have a hard time talking about these things? Yes. Yes and no. Um, no, because there are people out there like me. And that was really comforting. That was really great to find other people that came out, because I kept it to myself for a long time, um, who came out with that critical analysis of what exactly we were involved in, who before we could articulate what moral injury was, right? Um, and other such things. And, but then also very much yes, because coming from a military family, uh, t I guess personal sharing here is I'm not, a, I'm not associated with um, half of my family, I'm biracial, white, and First Nations. And so the white side of my family was, that was very much our identity. Uh, my father was active duty and retired. My uncle active duty and retired. My brother-in-law, my brother. Um, and so I know that I, I can't talk about that with them and so many other things. Um, and there are you get to a point where you can kind of see where people are at, gauge where veterans are at and they're thinking, a very um, pro-military person. I've learned to see the signs of who I can have those conversations with right off the bat or who I have to kind of ease into um, conversation with. And, um, you know, I have, I have friends that I think have, I've been able to witness their experience with their friends who are still active duty and there's a lot of pushback. Um, a lot of chastising and et cetera. Um, but the relationship's a little bit different, right? They were just people that knew each other. And I think that's why uh, conversations with people that we're already close to can sometimes be a little bit easier. Um, so I hope that, hope that answers your question. Um, this is also for Phoenix. You mentioned just uh, the amount of information you're fed and in indoctrination that will make you think of your enemy as the other and if you don't approach them with like straight out racism you're chastised for it and your opinion does it seem like a decent amount of people already come in with these type of thoughts and ideologies towards these other people or are they more so adopted over time once you become enlisted and recruited or whatever and become more involved because uh, I just know a few people who I had never heard certain words come out of their mouths and ideas about people, and then now they're active military, and they're like, "Oh, the, 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 like, just, I was like, bruh, you can't say that." <laughs> like, but I'm, I don't know if that's the way he felt beforehand, or if it was just something he felt more comfortable saying now that it was reinforced. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, both. Uh, so I, I definitely think uh, that it, uh, it does embolden people, right? And that as, as a, a body of people living in the U.S., there are things that we've normalized, right? And I think that those constructs of thinking are all built into us from very early on. And even people who don't outright express those ideas, I feel like they're conjured up. Right? And then they're also, and then people who might not, not even have those ideas, I've seen that happen, where they go in as one person and they come out years later completely different. And um, it's, it's very unfortunate. I think that, I think that pressure is really there because it's, we're, I realized through leaving the military, right, is that we're, I mean, in a base is an entire functioning society in town. I mean, we can close the gates and we have everything we need. And so sometimes we do just really um, exist together and not with civilians, as we say. 
that was a concept that I even had to get over. Um, and, and even my own personal experience, I think I have to, I've always wondered how, like, how I got here. And I think I have to thank my ancestors for that, of something else that bled through me, because for all intents and purposes, I should be just like any other uh, really hateful person who believed all of this stuff, but it just never stuck to me. Um, so, and I know there's strong people out there as well, but I have to say that I was never prepped to go into the military as, as a woman, let alone an indigenous woman, let alone live in the world as an indigenous woman. So I think that had a factor as well. But if you're just a general white male going in, um, I think yes to both of your questions. Thank you. Um, I had one for Yesenia. How do you talk to people um, who you're having those, I believe, you know, we say immigrant rights are human rights, and that's my belief, my personal belief. So if I'm talking with someone and they're saying, oh, well, those folks at the border, they shouldn't be coming, whatever that rhetoric is, how do we have those open conversations that moves us both forward to, to me, seeing people as human? And, um, and then, uh, because I'm going to hog it, um, and also Phoenix, I was wondering if you could give us an update, if you know, or maybe Asenia, on um, permanent residents who aren't citizens who've been like joining the military for decades and then being told you can you know, become a citizenship through, I think, joining the military, but then they're changing things around now. And I was just wondering what the update is on, because that's a way they recruit folks too, is promise you citizenship, put your life out on the line, and then you come home and maybe you don't get it. So thank you. Um. So, um, yeah, I think it's really hard to have uh, those conversations um, because they're so emotionally charged. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, I mean, I think, like, at least when, when I have conversations with um, folks who really have no idea what's going on, um, I just try to bring in as many facts as possible. Um, I, um, I'm from Arizona and um, worked at the Florence Project um, with individuals who were detained um, in Arizona. So um, I tried to speak um, from that experience and um, just really trying to explain that there's no easy way to come here lawfully and um, really um, just talking about how long it takes for people to actually um, become a lawful permanent resident and how hard it is for people to actually apply for asylum. Um, most people who are coming to the ports of entries are going to be detained for probably the duration of their asylum case, and there's very few people who are actually granted asylum, especially in detention. Um, immigrants don't have the right to legal counsel in most places. Um, so, it, I mean, people who don't have an immigration attorney have a lot um, um, less of a chance of getting legal status, and um, Immigration judges are part of the federal government, so um, it's already, um, the cards are already really stacked against um, immigrants who are going up against an immigration judge. And not to mention the fact that um, the U.S. has really played a big role in destabilizing a lot of these countries where um, we are getting a number of immigrants and continues to play um, a role in, you know, taking away resources and all of these things that can make um, those countries, um, or people rely on their own resources and stay in their own countries. So just trying to bring in as much knowledge as possible and patience. As for the second half of the question, uh, you know, I'd have to very boldly say is the military doesn't care about you. And um, and I, you know, I've started at the beginning is uh, occupied country. We have indigenous people who are serving and, and it's really hard because when we talk about, you know, your question, 
is people are internalizing all of that. And uh, to be living in the U.S., to be under white supremacy, is to lose your identity by force and, um, and be reassigned something. And you're definitely reassigned something when you go into the military. And so I think about indigenous people enlisting and being a part of have, enduring the poverty draft or just trying to hack it in this kind of a society. It's, it's controversial to share uh, or to serve in, you know, the conversations in my community are, you know, quite interesting. I've been called a traitor, um, but then I've also been patted on the back and told I'm a hero. And, you know, then I move forward into, you know, Uh, into uh, this, I can't remember the specifics of your question, but um, coming back and having nothing, right? And so I think about um, black Americans who served in the Vietnam War and very specifically like the housing program that was offered um, when you return as, a, as some kind of thank you or a perk or whatever, is not only was the, the welcome not friendly, but Black Americans didn't even have access to that. That they weren't being uh, they weren't being sold homes. That they this, there was no follow through on this program, um, and but there was that idea that if you served the country, right, then there was some type of acceptance. There's not. And then we look at people, you know, immigrating over that are thinking following this, you know, this American dream that is just it's so false, thinking that they can come here and and find stability, find home, find opportunity, but we have, we have a center for deported veterans just south of the border in Mexico, where these veterans have been living and just waiting in queue for a while. Um, there was some type of movement. There was an article, I didn't read the full article, but there was something to do with changing the status of deported veterans. I would just encourage anybody to just look into that because Veterans for Peace, we, we have actively been um, a part of educating about that. It's not a mission that I'm on um, specifically, but I do hope to learn more in the future and in what that looks like. So the Veterans for Peace uh, website will definitely have more information for those who are curious. Um, we're out of time, um, and, but uh, I'd like to thank you ladies for coming. It's been a beautiful event. Thank you.